Recently, I was on an airplane, and I had a three-hour conversation with the man sitting next to me about Christianity. And he was a professing Christian of, of sorts, had a Christian background, um, still attended church every now and then. And we were having a great conversation about church and faith, and I was telling him I'm a pastor and all this stuff, until the question of biblical morality came up. And then our great conversation turned into a great debate. And it became clear that while this man wanted to maintain some kind of uh, connection to Jesus, he had serious issues with the Bible's teaching on morality. Like some parts of it he liked uh, and would tell me that, and then some parts he did not. And he felt free to discard the parts that he did not. Uh, It was basically a grab bag approach to the whole question. So it wasn't that he was in favor of total lawlessness. That wasn't, that's not what he was at. He insisted that certain things were really right and certain things were really wrong. He simply didn't want to let the whole Bible tell us what those things were. And so after, you know, an hour or so of going around in circles on these sort of questions, I pointed out the fact that he was picking and choosing which biblical laws to obey. And then what do you think he said? He said, we all pick and choose. He asked the same sort of question that probably some of you have asked, certainly some of the members of your church ask. Um, Why do we insist on the abiding relevance of biblical laws on sexual conduct and feel free to eat shellfish and pork? Aren't we conservative, Bible-believing Christians picking and choosing as well? Aren't we being hypocritical? And that question, uh, and ones like it, is often a barrier to faith for some unbelievers. Sometimes it's the actual barrier. Uh, They're willing to discuss Christ if that question can be answered, the question about God's expectations and laws. Other times, the question, the accusation of hypocrisy is just a smokescreen for the real barrier, which is that they want to keep doing whatever it is they're currently doing. And the hypocrisy of Christians is a convenient excuse for dismissing the claims of Christ altogether. So whether it's real or or, um, a facade, that's an issue. Um, And those types of ethical questions aren't simply pressing because of evangelism. They're pressing for the sake of discipleship in the church itself. Questions about morality, about the law of God, are sometimes part of the reason that professing Christians drift away from the faith. The apparent inconsistency of the Bible makes it easier to drift from Christ, to set aside his teachings, and to go our own way And so what this means, I think, is that ethical instruction, teaching about what God requires of us in our daily lives, is crucial for Christian discipleship in the 21st century. We can't assume that people entering our churches or coming to faith for the first time have a common understanding of God's expectations. 200 years ago, 100 years ago, maybe even 60 years ago, you might be able to assume a lot of common ground between Christians and non-Christians on the question of morality. So even people who rejected the doctrines of the Bible, so think a hundred years ago in the fundamentalist modernist controversy, shared understanding of morality, different understandings of the supernatural. It was the virgin birth, it was miracles, it was the resurrection of Christ that was the dividing line between liberal Christians and conservative Christians. Today it's the opposite. Even people who rejected the doctrines of the Bible hundred years ago, or like Thomas Jefferson, embraced the moral instruction of the Bible. But now it's the Bible's moral teaching that appears confusing, inconsistent, and even absurd to modern people in the West. And so in many ways, our situation today is more like the early centuries of the church. So if you think about when Jews converted to Christianity in the New Testament era, there was a massive amounts of common ground on moral questions, with the exception of the Jewish distinctives of Sabbath-keeping and kosher laws, which is what the New Testament uh, addresses. Um, But as more and more pagans and Gentiles came to Christ, the pastors and elders in the early church had to devote more and more time to teaching people how God expected them to live, because they didn't know. The earliest Christian literature that we have, things like the Didache, um, spend a lot of time on ethical instruction helping people to understand what God expects for them in terms of their thoughts, their affections, their actions. So like in those early texts, you'll have the two ways to live. 
There's the way of life and the way of death. And that teaching on the two ways contains lots of do's and don'ts. Love God, love your neighbor, don't murder, don't commit fornication, don't steal, don't practice magic or sorcery, don't abort your children, don't be greedy or hypocritical, don't slander, don't be double-tongued. That, that's the sort of thing that early Christian discipleship man, manuals are focused on, in addition to the theological distinctives of Christianity. In other words, discipleship in the early church contained much teaching on how to live, on what it means to follow Christ in our conduct, because people just didn't know. And there was a large gulf between the way of the world and the way of Christ. And so it is today. Which means one of the pressing challenges for ministry is to gain and offer clarity on what our obligations before God are for the sake of evangelism and the sake of discipleship. And so my talk this afternoon breaks down roughly into two parts. First, I want to offer some general comments about approaching the law of God. First, highlighting different types of law and then drawing attention to different layers or aspects of the Mosaic law in particular. And then second, in light of that taxonomy, that categorization way of approaching the law, I want to give three ways that clarity about God's law can serve our efforts at discipleship. That's the goal for today. So, approaching the law in general. When we hear the word law, we immediately think of a rule that we have to obey. We think of obligations, typically they're imposed upon us from outside. So traffic laws, criminal laws, things like that. But law, especially if you read older theologians, is really a much broader category that includes obligations imposed from outside as well as principles placed within us and within other things by nature. So law is the thing that covers both outside obligations and then internal trajectories. So we're going to take a step back and consider law in its broadest sense. So, at the macro level, a law is something that determines what a particular thing does or should do. Something that determines what a particular thing does or should do. And you can hear how generic that is. It's a rule or a standard or a principle by which an action is determined. Rule, standard, principle by which an action is is determined. Say it another way, it's a guide that directs and restrains and channels the power of a particular thing in particular directions. Or here's probably the a simplest definition. You're writing a bunch of them, I know, but here's the simplest one, I think. Law is what orders and directs a particular thing in a particular way. So, when theologians in the past have discussed the concept of law, they often begin with God and then work their way down from there. And so, they'll begin with the character of God himself, his inherent perfection that guides and directs him in everything that he does. So, God's nature and his character is what directs and guides him in all of his actions. That's the highest and ultimate form of law. And all other forms of law in some way, in the world, in some way reflect or manifest the eternal law of God's character. So that's the first type of law I want you to have in your head. The eternal law of God's own character. But then moving down from there, for example, when we apply the eternal law of God's own character to nature, meaning non-rational, natural world, we get... Laws of nature or natural phenomena, things like gravity or photosynthesis in plants or instinct in animals or digestion in our bodies. That's the laws of natural phenomena. Similarly, this is interesting if you read older treatments of the subject, um, theologians will move from laws of natural phenomena to angelic law or celestial law. You think that's weird. Um, have you ever asked, what governs the angels? And they said, look, the angels are creatures, and they need to have some kind of rule or guide that directs their behavior. We don't know hardly anything about it. Like, we, we just don't know what it is, but it exists, 
And so it's out there, and it's a category of the, it's one of the ways that God's eternal character is manifested in the world he's made. So there's something called angelic law, which is largely inscrutable to us. We just don't have the information. And then third, so now we have law of natural phenomena, angelic law, and then third, they move down to the law of human nature. This is the law that governs human beings by their very nature, the law that's written on every heart. It's God's design for human beings embedded in our very nature and conscience, and all people have access to it precisely because they are human beings made in God's image. It's why Paul, in the book of Romans, can give a long list of sins. Covetousness, malice, envy, murder, strife, disobedience to parents, faithlessness, heartlessness, ruthlessness. And then say about all people everywhere, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So they know such things are wrong, that God's character is opposed to those actions And yet they do them anyway. They violate the law of human nature. Now, how do they know these things? Where did they get them? Well, they didn't all read them in a book. Instead, because we're human, because we're made in God's image, and God has made his character known to us in creation in our conscience, we know the fundamental law of human nature. We have access to it. So, eternal law of God then manifests itself in the world in the law of natural phenomena, that's gravity, in angelic law, and in the law of human nature. All of these are forms of law that originate in God, but are woven into the very fabric of creation. But then, on top of that, we can talk about, and this is, I'm going to use this term, and I'm not sure if it's the best one, but it's what I'm going to use, so I'm going to define it, the law of grace. Okay, now here's what I mean by law of grace. This is the kind of law that we don't and can't know by nature. In other words, you need God to tell it to you from outside of you. You don't know it because you look inside and and your conscience convicts you. You only know it if God reveals it to you through special revelation. After the fall, it's the kind of law that tells us how we can be made right with God. In other words, the gospel would be the highest example of law of grace. Now, I know that's a little bit confusing because typically we put law on one side and gospel on the other. We can talk that way. Here, we're talking about law in the broadest sense. And so in this sense, the gospel is a form of, it's an obligation that's meant to guide us. It's how we know how we can be made right with God. So the gospel is not written on our hearts by nature. It's written on our hearts by grace. In order to know the gospel, we need a preacher who comes to us from outside. We need good news from outside of us, not simply knowledge from our conscience. So the law of human nature gives us the bad news because our conscience tells us that we break it. The law of grace then comes from outside of us to show us how we can be made right again with God. So it's a different kind of of law. And then beyond these, we can talk about two other kinds of law. What I'm going to call prudential law, prudential law, and symbolic law. So prudential law is law that applies in particular circumstances and is a matter of wisdom and application. So when Moses implements Jethro's plan, remember that in Exodus 18, Jethro says, hey, you're going to kill yourself. This is a bad idea. You shouldn't, you shouldn't be taking all this weight. He says, this is what you should do. And Moses said, that's a good idea. I'm going to implement that plan. That was a matter of prudential law. When he organized Israel then as a result of that, it was, it's the sort of thing where that's a good way to do it. It's not the only way to do it. It's a good way to do it, but it's not the only way. It's a matter of prudence. The same would be true, for example, of our traffic laws. Okay, we, last, last uh, fall, my family... Uh, went to England, and um, I had the privilege and terror of driving, um, and it was, it was awful. It was just awful. Um, I white-knuckled it the whole way because everything was backwards. And now, is there a right way and a wrong way to organize your traffic laws? The answer is there's not one right way or one right, wrong way. It's just there's a good way, and there's another way, Okay. Um, 
right? <laughs> it's like the old joke um, um, about worship. You know, we both worship God, you in your way and me in his. Um, <laughs> so prudential law, like traffic laws, like the Jethro's outline for organizing Israel, that's prudential law. We need to decide which side of the road to drive on and when to stop and go, but those laws aren't universal and they can be changed. Second category here is symbolic law. Symbolic law. And this refers to laws that are not rooted in nature, but instead are designed to teach and instruct us in some way. So things like circumcision in the Old Testament, baptism in the New Testament, and the Lord's Supper are examples of symbolic law that aren't rooted directly in human nature, but are instead intended to represent and remind us of God's works in history. And often, symbolic law is tied especially to that law of grace. It's one of the things that represents and reflects that more fundamental law of grace. And so just as prudential law, wisdom and application, applies the law of human nature in particular contexts, like the principle underneath both British and American traffic laws is we need to be organized so we don't crash. We want to love our neighbors so that we don't crash into each other. And then here's a good way to do it, here's another way to do it. Okay, That's prudential law that's applying a more fundamental principle of we don't want cars running into each other. Similarly, symbolic law applies the law of grace in particular contexts or at particular times and eras. So, recap here. Okay, Approaching the law of God. Eternal law of God's character. Three types of law then that are embedded in creation itself. Law of natural phenomena, gravity. Angelic law law of human nature. Alongside that, we have law of grace, which comes from special revelation, and then now prudential law, like traffic laws, and symbolic law, like baptism. And then finally, um, we just need to recognize that um, when we actually encounter laws in general, those, those different categories are often all mixed up into a single published law, published law, like a law code. So this refers to a law code as a whole, which is published in a particular time and a particular place. So the law of human nature is written on the heart, but if you write it down, like on tablets, then it's published law. And published law could either be human or divine. So published human law would be things like the law of particular nations, like America or Sweden. Or church law, so your church constitution, your bylaws, would be an example of a published human law. Uh, or a code of conduct in a company. Like if you run a business and you have a code of conduct, that would be human law. Um, also, you would have published divine law. That would be things like the law of Moses or even the Sermon on the Mount. In many cases, good published law will build on the law of human nature, but frequently clarify or extend or apply that universal law of human nature so that we have clearer and more direct knowledge of what God expects from us. That's how published law tends to clarify, extend, and apply that fundamental law that we have embedded by nature. So, now turn and think with me a little bit carefully about the law of Moses, for example. So when we're talking about the law of Moses, we're dealing with published divine law. It's a law code, and it's an integrity. It's a whole law code. And that has important implications for how we approach it. The law of Moses, including the Ten Commandments, is a covenant for the people of Israel from Exodus until the coming of Christ. It's God's law for God's people in a particular era of redemptive history. Which means that as Christians, we are not directly under the Mosaic law at all, including the Ten Commandments as a covenant. We're not under the Ten Commandments as a covenant. It was a covenant for a different era of redemptive history history. Now, that immediately raises a question. Wait, so you're saying that we're free to commit idolatry and steal and bear false witness? We're not under the Ten Commandments, so we're free to do all the things? No, I'm not saying that. Those commandments are rooted in and founded upon that universal law of human nature, which is binding on all people everywhere. Think of it like this. The United States has laws against stealing, 
And I'm told, so does England. If you steal something in the United States, you can be punished. But you won't be punished by a British court. You'll be punished by an American court. Why? Because even though both have laws against stealing, you're not under British law, you're under American law. Okay. Similarly, even though in both Old and New Covenants, from all eras of history, from creation to the end, stealing is forbidden, the reason you refrain from stealing is not because it's written in Moses. Because you're not under Moses. You live in the New Covenant. So, in the same way that we're not under the laws of England, even though there's lots of similarities between the law of England and the laws of America, so also we're not under the Mosaic law as a covenant, including the Ten Commandments. Instead, we're under Christ in the New Covenant. So, now, shift gears. Let's keep thinking about Moses for a minute. Even though we're not under the Mosaic law as a covenant, the Mosaic law is still Scripture, and therefore God breathed, and therefore useful for instructing and equipping us to do what God requires. And so we ought to meditate and reflect upon the Mosaic law so that we can grow in knowledge of God and knowledge of ourselves. And so now let's try to take some of what we've just talked about law in general and apply it more particularly to the law of Moses. If we do, I think that we begin to recognize different layers, layers is a good word, aspects, is another good word, to the law of Moses. So within this covenant, this law covenant, this published divine law, there's different layers or aspects of the whole, and so let's talk about three of them. Number one, there is a layer of the law of Moses that is totally founded on the law of human nature and is therefore universal and unchangeable. Don't murder and don't steal have always been requirements for human beings. So when God wrote the laws on the tablets... He wasn't giving Israel new information. It wasn't like murder's totally fine and then Moses comes down the mountain and the people are like, oh, that's new. Murder was always a violation of God's character as it's imprinted on human nature. The the sixth commandment simply republishes that universal law of human nature in a clear verbal way because as fallen human beings... We're prone to ignore it and disobey it. You might think of it as God telling you twice. Once, because he made you, but you suppress and ignore it. And then again, on tablets, so that you really know it. You can't evade uh, the, the obligation. So we know God's righteous decree against murder and theft. We know it by nature, and we do it anyway. And so the natural law layer of the law of Moses, which I think includes much of the Ten Commandments, as well as laws that are related to those Ten Commandments, is still binding on us, not because we're under the law of Moses, but because we're human beings made in God's image. And this layer of the law, theologians often refer to as the moral law. It's the moral law. That's the first layer. Second layer. There is a layer of the law that is not founded on the law of human nature, but instead on symbolism and typology. Remember we talked about symbolic law a moment ago. So those laws about circumcision or about clean and unclean animals or about sacrifices, they reflect that layer of the law. And this layer, unlike the first, is changeable. This is important. It's changeable. Eating pork was once contrary to God's law for his people. It was a sin. But it wasn't a sin because it was a law of human nature. It was a sin because it was teaching Israel something. And we could talk more about what that particular something is on any of these cases, but we're getting categories here. Once it was wrong and contrary to God's law to eat pork. Now it's not. And thank God. At one time, sin required the killing of a goat or an oxen. Now it doesn't. Theologians call this the ceremonial aspect of the Mosaic Law. So there's a moral aspect. And a ceremonial aspect. And I'm calling them aspects because I don't want you to think that there's certain laws that are just moral, pure and simple, and certain other ones that are totally different that are ceremonial. Because sometimes they could be mixed up together. You could have a a ceremonial aspect and a moral aspect in the same published law. Finally, there's a layer of the law of Moses 
that includes applications of the law of human nature in a particular context. A lot of Old Testament case law falls under this category. So the laws that begin, if your oxen breaks out and gores someone, this is the penalty. And if he was in the habit of breaking out and goring people, it's worse. Okay? Or um, if a man steals an ox and sells it, then he must repay fivefold. Now this aspect often contains particular penalties, particular punishments for disobedience. And this layer, even though this layer doesn't directly apply to us, because we're not under Moses, this layer is still an example and a model for us as wisdom, as we seek to apply the universal law of human nature in our own context. These case laws can often show us how serious certain violations of the law are. Like We can learn, based on how God punished things in the Old Testament, how big of a deal was it. And if it's still binding on us in some form, how serious should it be for us today? This layer is often called the judicial or the civil aspect of the law. So let me pull some of these threads together. Again, we're trying to get categories, and then I'm going to say, why why are we spending time in a conference that's trying to help pastors serve their people? Why spend time doing this sort of thing? Why does it matter? So we'll come back to that, but let me summarize first, okay? How do we approach the law? God's holy character is reflected and expressed First, in the law of human nature, which is universal and unchangeable, all times and all places. The law of Moses is a specific published covenant between God and his people for a particular era of redemptive history. The laws within it contain various layers in various combinations. There's a moral layer which is connected to that universal law. There's a ceremonial layer, which teaches through symbols and images and can be changed when God chooses. And there's a judicial layer, a civil layer, which applies the moral and ceremonial layer in Israel's context with particular penalties and then which we can use as wisdom in our own attempts to apply God's law. But as Christians, we're not directly under the Mosaic Law as a covenant. We're under grace. We're in Christ. All authority has been given to him as the head of the new covenant. Now, at this point, I could run the Sabbath through that grid and see what happens, okay? But I don't have time. So instead, I'm going to move to the why it matters. Why does this matter? How does clarity about the law of God serve our discipleship in the 21st century? I've got three things here. First, clarity on the law serves discipleship because it helps us to answer the guy on the airplane, whether he's a Christian or not. It answers the accusation that as Christians, we're being arbitrarily selective in insisting that homosexuality is a a grave offense against God while wearing polyester and eating bacon-wrapped shrimp is not. We're not being selective. We're being wise. We're being careful readers of our Bible, and we're learning who we are and when we are, and where we are, and therefore which aspects of the word apply to us. And it's crucial that you as a pastor or church leader get clarity on these things so that you can offer clarity to your people so that they don't buckle under the charge of hypocrisy. Christian boldness requires clarity. You won't, and your people won't, preach the gospel clearly, both the good news and the bad news, if there's confusion about what God requires. And if there's a fear that we're being hypocritical in insisting on things like biblical sexual ethics while not obeying kosher food laws. Clarity in our categories serves Christian witness Because with that clarity, we have confidence in what God requires of us and therefore what Jesus demands from the world. That's the first reason why this matters, why getting clear matters. Second, clarity serves our discipleship because it helps us rightly orient to debates and discussions within the church. It gives us different categories to put certain issues in different categories. Particularly, it helps us to distinguish between nature and scripture and culture. Nature, scripture, culture. Culture. English is nice that it's got, you know, a nice little chur, chur, chur there. I like it. Anyway, um, 
You guys are all pastors. You get that. You're like, oh, yeah. It's like reverse alliteration. It's like not at the front, but it's at the back. Okay. By nature, I mean that law of human nature that establishes the built-in tendencies and trajectories that make us human. That's nature. Scripture is the promises and commands of God recorded in the Bible. And then culture is the customs and traditions in particular times and places. That includes things like hot dish, holidays, removing your hat when you go indoors, bowing your head to pray, sending Christmas cards. These are customs, traditions, culture. Now, all of those are authorities. Nature, scripture, and culture all have authority. But they have, they're different kinds of authorities. Natural tender, tendencies are just there. They're embedded in your head. They're just like gravity is there. That's how you obey it. It's just there. Uh, when it comes to scripture, we believe the promises and we obey the commands. And then when it comes to customs and culture, we respect and we honor them. Now, those authorities are often interwoven. Um, a pastor friend of mine relates custom and nature in this way. He says, this is a good definition of a custom. A custom is a prudential application of a natural law principle in a concrete setting. I'm going to say that again. It's a good definition. A custom is a prudential application of a natural law principle in a concrete setting. So notice that beneath the custom is some kind of principle, a tendency, a trajectory. And a custom is a wise application of that principle in a particular time and place. So um, nature teaches that you should honor your parents. There's a built-in tendency. It's, it's baked into the cake of human nature. But the form that that um, uh, respect takes may vary from culture to culture. So widen out. Let me get more wide there. So um, let's not talk just honoring your parents. Let's talk honoring elders, meaning people who are older than you. Okay? I don't know about where to, what happened when you, where you grow up, um, but I've lived in different places in my life. And in some places, if you wanted to show respect to an adult male who was not related to you, you would call them Mr. Last Name, Mr. Rigney. Other places that I've lived have done the same thing, but it's been Mr. First Name, so Mr. Joe. Okay. Now, in both cases, there's an attempt to show honor to an adult male who's not related to me, but the form differs, the custom differs, but the principle underneath the custom is the same. Um, here's another example. Uh, in some cultures, you want to express honor to someone, you bow to them. In other cultures, you want to express honor to someone, you kneel before them. So bowing versus kneeling. They're both actions. They're both meant to respect, reflect honor, but which one? Uh, different salutes, right? Military salutes would be another example. Different nations have a different salute. The salute, the idea behind the salute is the same. The principle is the same. Show honor to a superior officer. But the form of the salute differs from culture to culture, there's different customs. This is the kind of category we're trying to get. I think the same thing would be true like in Paul's letters when he ends a number of them by telling the um, church to greet one another with a holy kiss, okay? I think that what Paul, so underneath that is that the, there needs to be natural affection that's expressed through a particular custom. In that day, holy kissed expressed the affection that you should have among each other. In our culture, it might be something different. It might be a hug, it might be a, a handshake and a smile, but some way to communicate the natural affection that we have for one another. So the custom might vary, but the principle underneath it is the same. Now, why does this matter? Um, how does this help our church discussions? A key aspect of customs is propriety or fittingness. Customs, because they express this natural law principle, there ought to be a fitness or a propriety between the custom and God's design. So think about something like 1 Timothy chapter 2, where Paul says this. Women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper, there's the word, fitting, for women who profess godliness, namely with good works. So notice there's a propriety between good works and godliness, and there's an impropriety between a profession of godliness and immodesty or luxurious dress. Okay? Now, the, now in, Paul actually singles out particulars, braided hair, gold, and pearls. How do, we, how do we think about that? Does that mean for all times and all places, braided hair means is, is offensive to God? No, I don't think so. I think that respectability and modesty are universal. But the form that that 
respectability and modesty um, can differ. It can be, it's customary. But there needs to be a fitness and a propriety between the custom and the principle. Um, drill into it a little bit more to get this category of fitness down. Proverbs 26.1 says, Like snow in summer or rain in harvest, so honor is not fitting for a fool. Okay? Snow is out of place in summer. Honor is out of place for a fool. Sometimes fitness is a moral category. Sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. That's the same idea. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. Titus 2, Paul says that there is a kind of conduct that fits with sound doctrine. And then he proceeds to give moral instruction to different groups in the church. Older men, older women, younger women, so forth. That fitting conduct is passed down from generation to generation, older to younger, through modeling and teaching. Or here's a really clear example of trying to get nature, scripture, culture all in one passage. Okay, Listen to 1 Corinthians 11. Paul says this, judge for yourselves, is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him, but if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? Now, I know this is a confusing passage. All I'm trying to illustrate at this point is that here we have scripture in which Paul appeals to nature in order to get at what is culturally proper. They're there. And so thinking about how you divide that out is really important to get clarity for your people. And those categories, why are we bringing these up? Because we really struggle with these kind of distinctions in the modern world. Especially how to think about the authority of custom and culture. Sometimes what we want to do is we seek to take our customs, our culture, and give them a promotion. We turn them into divine law when they are really matters of wisdom. So these are matters of wise application, but we turn them into divine law and then try to impose them on other people in ways that are inappropriate and illegitimate. On the other hand, there are times when we clearly see wide variation in custom, cultural expression, and so we conclude, oh, it's completely arbitrary. Anything goes. Who's to say which is the correct way to salute or the proper form of address or whether we should wear hats indoors? Who's to say? It's anything goes. So In that case, we're recognizing, hey, there's a difference between nature and scripture on the one hand and culture on the other. And so we, we, that's right, there is a distinction. But then we wrongly conclude that culture is just relative and doesn't have any binding force upon us. We want, so what we do, this is the danger we run into. We either want clear and absolute laws on the one hand or total freedom, anything goes. If something is culturally conditioned, anything goes. In other words, when it comes to customs and traditions and culture, Americans are highly individualistic and often relativistic. We substitute fashion, which is an individual choice rooted in consumeristic market stuff, for custom. Customs are often communal practices that endure over time. So that makes it difficult for us. We're individualistic. The second factor that makes it difficult is the simple fact of mobility. This is really important for you to get, okay? Because we have cars and because we move, it's difficult for us to establish stable custom over time. Because customs require stable communities, communities where people uh, are born, grow up, live, die, and they pass on the customs of their people from generation to generation. A highly mobile society militates against that completely because you've got all sorts of people with all sorts of customs getting slammed together. This is at least a problem. I'm a pastor in the Twin Cities. This is the sort of thing we run into. Maybe if you're in a more rural or suburban context, there's more stability and you can actually have stable custom. Um, Because people are often moving in and out, because groups tend to segregate by age, and because the endurance of customs over time requires them to be handed down generation to generation, it's hard for us to really wrap our minds around it. So, because of that, it's hard for us to get clear on custom, but it's important for us to do so, so that we don't take our customs and turn them into divine law, nor do we think that just because something is cultural, there's not good reasons for it. That this isn't a wise application of natural law principles in a particular setting. Final reason, and this is the last thing I've got. Clarity on the law of God serves discipleship by helping us to think through our public and political witness. This is important, maybe particularly relevant in an election year. 
So when it comes to issues of public concern, here's how I think we should approach these. Where scripture and nature are clear, we ought to speak clearly and prophetically. The church should say things like, you may not. It is not lawful, like John the Baptist did to Herod. You may not do that. It's unlawful. And this is one of those places where I think the Ten Commandments, even though we're not under them as a covenant, but we, all, we do learn from them as a reflection of God's law of human nature, the Ten Commandments, especially the second table of the law, can guide us in discerning which issues are clear. Honor your parents. Respect and protect human life. Respect and protect marriage and the family. Respect and protect other people's property. I'm saying these all positively. These are just the the Ten Commandments, five through ten. Respect and protect other people's property. Respect and protect other people's reputations and the integrity of our legal system. Be content with what God has given you and don't grasp after what other people have. Okay, so... The nearer that any public action comes to clearly and flagrantly violating one of those, then the clearer we as pastors ought to be in speaking about it. So when it comes to issues of human life or human dignity in relation to racial or ethnic superiority or to human sexuality and the family, you ought to speak very clearly about such things. At the same time, clarity about the law reminds us that there are many areas of politics and lawmaking and public policy that don't infringe obviously and directly on those fundamental rights, those fundamental obligations. Much of public policy is a matter of prudence, of wisdom, in which lawmakers are seeking to balance competing goods. Here's what I mean. The ability to defend oneself and one's family from harm is a good, it's a good thing. The ability to keep wicked men from having easy opportunities to inflict violence on the weak is also a good thing. Debates about the right to bear arms and gun control and proper restrictions, anything related to that, ought to be about prudently and wisely navigating those competing goods. Or how about this? The disposition to welcome foreigners and refugees is good. Upholding the rule of law and preserving societal stability, also a good. Debates about immigration ought to, be, ought to be about prudently and wisely navigating those goods, which can sometimes be in tension. The same is true about health care, tax rates, deficits, environmental protection. These are areas of prudence and folly, not necessarily of clear righteousness and wickedness, although in some cases they might be clear righteousness and wickedness there. And they are areas where people of goodwill can and will disagree. And so, as pastors, we must not turn every speech into prophetic speech. There is no, thus saith the Lord, about the appropriate tax rates or immigration rates or environmental regulations. There are general principles of justice and equity and there's priorities that can be set and then there's space for us as human beings to use wisdom to apply those principles in our various contexts. And therefore, our orientation to those kind of debates and to those who disagree with us on those issues ought to reflect the difference. So, consider this an exhortation as you evaluate your orientation to the hot political topics of the day. Okay, All of these issues are important. God's law does speak to them in some way, and you should care about them, and you could develop informed views on a whole host of issues, but it's vital to make distinctions. There is a time to say, you may not, it is unlawful, this is wicked, and there is a time to say, these issues are really complicated, let's reason together. And in a hyper-reactive age, in which social media rewards tribalism and amplifies the most extreme rhetoric, Christian faithfulness means learning the difference between when we must be prophetic and when we must absolutely not. So then, for the sake of our own clarity and boldness and witness, for the sake of wisely guarding and guiding our churches through the thorny thickets of nature, scripture, and culture, and for the sake of prophetic and prudent witness in the world, it's vital that we gain clarity on how we approach the law of God, and may he help us do so.
Let me pray. Father, we do need your grace, your wisdom. We need your spirit to guide us so that we rightly divide the word of truth. That we make the distinctions that you've placed there. And it takes wisdom. It's, um, you've not always made it easy for us when it comes to some of these questions. And part of growing up into maturity is learning to think clearly and to apply wisely your word in settings that are totally different from when it was written. So help us, God. Give us categories as pastors and church leaders. Give us categories that we can own and feel confident in so that we can then teach and instruct others for the sake of our people and for the sake of the gospel witness in the world. In Jesus' name, amen.